and welcome to Hawaii Together on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Aquino, your host and president of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. My guest today is Sterling Higa. He's the executive director of the new nonprofit Housing Hawaii's Future, which aims to educate and organize students and young professionals to help end one of the biggest problems that we face in Hawaii, which is a shortage of affordable and available housing for everyone. In other words, Sterling believes that youth can be a formidable force in solving our housing shortage and crisis in Hawaii. Young people can make an effective difference as change agents, and they can get involved in the civic process. We're going to talk about that today, and I want to welcome to our program Sterling Higa. Sterling, welcome to the program. Awesome. Thank you for having me, Kili. I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate all that you're doing and your group as well. Tell us first a little bit about yourself. Give our audience a little bit of background about you. I grew up in downtown Honolulu. I'm a graduate of public schools. I attended Royal Elementary, Kawananakoa Intermediate, and Roosevelt High School. I then went on to attend the UH System School, starting at Honolulu Community College, and then completing my bachelor's degree in speech with a minor in English at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, I went away to get a master's degree in education at Harvard, intending to work in arts nonprofits, and return to Hawaii in 2015. I ended up teaching middle school performing arts for a couple of years. I taught at Hawaii Pacific University, coaching debate and teaching public speaking for about five years. And I've also written as a columnist for Honolulu Civil Beat and as a contributing writer for Hawaii Business Magazine prior to getting involved with Housing Hawaii's Future. Uh, I was approached by two of the founders, Kili, um, Zachary Amata and Evan Gates, who had come up with the idea for this organization. And they wanted an executive director who had a background both in education and communication. And as soon as they presented the plan for the organization, I knew that I had to uh, be a part of the organization. Well, you've got quite an impressive background already in your life. And uh, I'm impressed, to say the least. But well, what is it that drives you to work on the housing crisis here in Hawaii? There are many things you could do. I imagine that there's a lot of passion in that for you. Yes. Well. I've seen my classmates from high school and from university move away steadily year by year to pursue opportunity elsewhere. And I'm 31 this year. And as I think about, you know, starting my own family in the next few years, I worry that my children, my grandchildren uh, won't be able to afford to stay in Hawaii. So it's an issue that every year becomes more urgent for me and for many of the people in my generation, the millennials. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But first, tell me a little bit about Housing Hawaii's Future, the nonprofit that you lead. What's the organization committed to and what does it do? Awesome. So Housing Hawaii's Future is a movement that is led by young locals who will create opportunities for Hawaii's Gen Z and millennials by ending the workforce housing shortage. Um, our goal is ultimately to raise awareness of the housing issue and to equip young leaders our young professionals, our students, people who are working uh, with the skills and knowledge they need to advocate for workforce housing. Um, because our belief is that these generations have the ability um, to advocate for themselves and that they are the ones that are being most viscerally affected by the cost of housing and forced to leave. Well, you're tackling a very important problem. And sometimes people may not realize fully how significant the problem is. How bad is Hawaii's housing situation right now? And who is hurt by it? Uh, I mean, you see million dollar median home prices on all of the islands. Uh, the working class, people who earn between 80 to 140% of the area median income, these are civil servants, these are people who work in education, people who work in healthcare, hospitality, skilled laborers even. Uh, the, these vital members of our community are really struggling. And every year you see thousands of people leaving to California or Nevada or Colorado or Washington or Texas to pursue a life somewhere else, dividing families. Um, the, the issue is bad. You know, we've often focused in the past just on the homeless issue, which is the most visible manifestation of our housing crisis. Um, but I think that we've neglected the fact that the middle class here is really being squeezed. I've appreciated the opportunity to sit around a table and talk with you about this. So I'd love it if you could share some of your insight as to why we have so many barriers to housing right now in Hawaii. What are these barriers? Sure. 
the when we do presentations and we've been doing a tour of the neighborhood boards explaining the work of our organization we typically divide the barriers into three categories so the first are the underlying economics obviously we have scarce developable land because we are islands and material costs are high because we have to import things the second category of barriers are the regulatory barriers and there was a recent report about the wharton index that was prepared by you hero at the university of hawaii that showed that uh, the counties in our state are among the most regulated in the country in terms of uh, putting up barriers to housing. Uh, many of these barriers were well intentioned at first, but it is uh, death by a thousand cuts, where if each barrier creates a slight friction for development and you keep adding barrier after barrier, you can end up in a situation where no new housing is being developed. And then the third category of barriers are what we call NIMBY opposition groups. These are not in my backyard people who come out to oppose development projects. Uh, the most recent examples of this would be in Kailua. There was an affordable housing project proposed there that was ultimately shot down. And currently this is playing out in Manoa Valley uh, where there is a senior housing project proposed for the Chinese cemetery in the back of the valley and some members of that community who oppose the development of any new housing there. Well, that's a very concise response that you've given, and, and I think it's fairly complete. Uh, you've told us that one of the problems is scarcity in and of itself. Secondly, the regulatory conditions here in Hawaii through our government. And third, the opposition that is faced by advocates and various advocacy groups. Now, with all those barriers, it's a wonder that we get any housing bill. But let, let's just, for a moment, parse out a little bit of each of them. When, we, when you talk about scarcity, is that a real and actual scarcity of land available, or is it more a contrived scarcity that we experience? Sure. I think there are two elements to that. The first is we do have a very small percentage of our land in the state, zoned, uh, not zoned, um, but allocated basically to urban uses through the state land use. Sort That's of de, six, de facto zoned, so to speak. Correct. About 6%, I think, of the land is available for urban usage. So we do limit the amount of land. Now, I think there's some merit to that. Obviously, in Hawaii, our natural resources are very important to the functioning of our society and to the culture here. So we don't obviously want to build everywhere, but we do artificially limit the amount of land that can be developed at the state level. Um, there's a second element though as well, which is the density of uh, housing that is allowed on land. And that is usually something that is affected at the county level. So if we only have 6% of our land zoned for urban uses, but we don't allow a lot of density, um, we're going to struggle to accommodate housing needs on that land. What other kinds of regulatory barriers do we have to increasing our supply of housing? Uh, so this is something that would require like a disposition. There are people who are much better informed on this subject uh, than I am. Uh, there are a variety of uh, permits and processes that people have to go through at the county level in order to uh, get their projects approved. Um, very often they have to, for large projects that have an impact, they have to get some measure of community support. Uh, the affordable housing project, for example, that was slated to be developed in Kailua ultimately stumbled because the county council uh, declined to approve uh, that project. So sure. there are um, discretionary decisions that government bodies can make, like the county councils that can sometimes stymie development. Uh, it is possible sometimes, even when permits are approved by, say, like Honolulu's Department of Planning and Permitting, uh, for those permits to be subsequently revoked because of community protest. Uh, so there are a variety of ways that projects can be locked down. Uh, there's also the potential lawsuits related to, say, environmental assessments, as happened with Coa Ridge. Um, and so there's a variety of uh, ways that development can ultimately be hampered by uh, regulatory barriers. Sure. And you also mentioned not in backyard, nimbyism to speak. But in addition to that, are there other forms of advocacy that make it difficult for development to go forward? Uh, 
I asking you in particular because you, you are very well versed in understanding your generation, and it looks like there are many advocates that, that are out there amongst youth who, although they may not benefit from this in the long run in terms of housing, who find themselves in opposition to development. Yeah, I think there is a, in large part, a general uh, bias against development in part because many local people feel that the kinds of developments that are taking place are not the kind that low hardworking local families can afford, right? The so-called luxury developments. And, and to some degree, that is a legitimate criticism, right? Um, obviously with million dollar median home prices, if we are building to meet that demand, that's really limiting these people within the 80 to 140% area median income, your middle class who really can't be a $40 million homes. Um, I think that the key to overcoming that resistance is to make sure that we have policies put in place that uh, help to incentivize uh, the construction of workforce housing or the kind of housing that local families can afford. Ultimately, you're not going to generate a broad consensus in favor of housing development if that development is just going to be snatched up by foreign buyers or people who don't live in those homes. As you may know, Grassroot Institute has run a series called Why We Left Hawaii. We've interviewed large numbers of individuals who would want to live in Hawaii, their home, but have left largely because of the cost of living and in particular the cost of housing. But there are other problems as well that young people who may not leave Hawaii face with regard to the high cost of housing and its shortage. Sterling, what are some of those problems that young people in Hawaii are facing due to our housing situation? There are many problems. Uh, here are a few. The first is many people are stuck in multi-generational living situations. They're not able to afford leaving their families. This ultimately impedes their own ability to become independent, but also to form their own families. It means that people delay marriage or having children. Uh, on the business side, you have a lot of people where it is hard to form a small business in part because you can't attract and retain quality employees because the cost of housing here means that you'd have to raise wages so high to compete with other places on the continental United States where the cost of housing is lower. So it delays family formation. It impacts the small business climate, makes it hard for people to start and expand businesses. And in a lot of ways, it's affecting people. But a bigger problem is one third of our state's population are so-called members of the Alice population. That's your asset limited, income constrained and employed families. These are working class families who are one car accident or medical emergency away from falling into poverty. So there's a very real sense where these families that are spending perhaps 40% or even 50% of their income on housing are not able to save. They're not able to escape from this Alice category, which means they're always perched on the edge of disaster. Hmm. It's a very precarious perch, unfortunately, and it means that a lot of people, in fact, are just one paycheck away from living in the streets. Uh, Sterling, uh, I love the name of your organization, Housing Hawaii's Future. It's extremely positive. Your, your approach, I believe, is to engage young people and students and professionals in particular. H how do you go about doing this? How do you engage them, and why is it important to reach them in particular? Sure. For students, we've been reaching out to Hawaii clubs at colleges and universities across the country. We're reaching out as well to the University of Hawaii System Schools, all 10 campuses. And we've reached out to organizations like the Center for Tomorrow's Leaders and the Odo Fellows, groups that are working with these young leaders. Um, it's important for students to be involved in this issue because students have been at the forefront of so many of these movements for social change. Uh, they've led on the issue of the environment, They've led on civil rights, and now it's their turn to lead on housing as well. For young professionals, people who are in the working class, we've been reaching out to them through the organizations they work for, through service clubs like the Rotary, the Junior Chambers of Commerce, um, and other organizations where young professionals congregate to help them realize that this is an issue, obviously, that they feel more acutely. Many of them are paying for their own housing, unlike many students who are still sheltered by their parents. Um, but the young professionals understand this issue. Um, to engage them, what we've tried to do is to create opportunities where they can participate in the civic process uh, and be effective. 
Now, what's been the response from young people as you've reached out to them and attempted to engage them? Initially, I think there's a lot of cynicism and pessimism, to be honest. Uh, most young people, we've talked to some teenagers even, who feel like they don't have a future here in our state. Uh, as we sort of talk through some of the opportunities that are available to them, you start to see the glimmer of, of hope, optimism, and, and even some excitement, um, where they realize that if they come together, that they can actually make a difference. And, and that's one of the most rewarding aspects of this work. What are some of the ways young people can actually make a difference? Sure. So there are a variety of places that young people can engage civically. Uh, one of the most important, and it's often not discussed much at all, is the neighborhood board system. So on the island of Oahu, there are 33 neighborhood boards that represent all of the communities. And these neighborhood boards do play an advisory role uh, for the county council when it comes to these large developments. And they also are impactful in influencing the decisions of elected officials, both at the county level and the state level, who attend these meetings. The governor and the mayor also usually send a representative to these meetings. So for our elected officials, they use the neighborhood boards as a place to keep a pulse on what the community is concerned about. The neighborhood boards tend to skew a little bit older in their membership. And so very often the concerns of people who are just forming their families, young workers or students are not represented at all. One of our hopes is that we can get young people engaged in all of the neighborhood boards just so that their voices are represented in the conversation there so that our elected officials are getting a more broad spectrum of the concerns in their community. Now, you're a nonprofit, and so as you go out and attempt to encourage young people to get onto neighborhood boards, uh, are, are you engaged with any particular political party or ideology, or are you fundamentally just looking for committed uh, young people who want to work hard towards solutions? We are not a politically affiliated organization. Um, as a 501c3, we are nonpartisan. Uh, to be honest, I think all that is necessary is to have young people involved in these discussions. Uh, party affiliation doesn't matter. Uh, the sad truth is that many people who are near retirement age or retired are disconnected firsthand from the kinds of struggles that young people are going through in terms of the cost of housing. So just getting young people at a seat at these tables so that they can represent both their own experiences, but also talk about the experiences that their peers are facing uh, is one of the greatest ways that we can sort of shift the narrative and help people to understand the challenges that are being faced. Now, uh, our city and county uh, neighborhood boards are really the starting point for public service in, in terms of an elective office. Uh, what kind of influence does a neighborhood board have? One might think that it's the lowest level of governance, and it certainly is the one that is the most local, uh, but uh, what have you discovered about the potential power and influence of neighborhood boards on housing decisions? I think the neighborhood board system is much more powerful than people uh, assume. Uh, a lot of people think that it's insignificant, but it is quite significant because these community members are often the most engaged. Uh, they're the people who participate in service and volunteer opportunities. They're the people who participate in sports teams or uh, various clubs in the community. They're the people who help out their schools. Um, being able to help these most influential members of the community understand the struggle that young people are facing builds this sort of uh, grassroots momentum across our uh, island here on Oahu where all of the elected officials who participate in these meetings and the members of the community begin to see um, that this is a real issue that's being faced by so many in the community. And that ultimately builds the sort of political will to take action. I think, you know, a lot of people have talked about solutions for years. The challenge has always been just to get people to actually be brave enough to take action. And I think that our elected officials uh, should be brave because the challenge is severe and there are thousands of young people who would love uh, to call Hawaii home and would love for their elected representatives to take action to make that possible.
Well, encouraging young people to get involved in the neighborhood boards is a great way of preparing them for future roles of service leading to legislature and beyond. And so uh, that's a very smart strategy. What is your long-term vision for the organization or, in, or what it will accomplish? And what are maybe some of the plans you have coming up in the near future? Sure. Ultimately, the hope is to build this constituency of young people who understand the workforce housing issue and have the skills and knowledge they need to advocate so that we can finally solve it. Some of the things we're working on is a pledge. So our hope is to have a few thousand young people sign a pledge in favor of workforce housing that's coming up as the election season proceeds toward the end of the election season. We'd like to roll that out and get out into the community, into the UH system schools at the neighborhood board level and get people engaged in saying, you know, workforce housing is a priority. It's something we need to address. And here we are, thousands of young people standing up to demand action. Um, beyond that, we're hoping to host candidate town halls for the candidates for governor. Uh, executive leadership on this issue is so important. And it's important that our voters are able to understand in depth what their candidates views on housing are. Um, a lot of times in a typical debate, there's one question about housing. It's do you support affordable housing? The answer is yes. And then it's next question. Um, but what about an hour where candidates are encouraged to engage in depth on the issue and to roll out their specific plans? Ultimately, that kind of information providing is the only way that the voters can make an informed decision about which candidates actually have their interests in mind. So we're hoping to host candidate town halls in the governor's race uh, to help the voting populace understand uh, which candidates have the best housing policies for them. Very good. Well, Sterling, it sounds very promising. I, I want to thank you so much for leading Hawaii's house, Hawaii, Hawaii, housing Hawaii's future, right? Did I get it correct? You got it. And uh, thank you so much for all that you're contributing to the future leadership of our state. Uh, my guest today has been Sterling Higa, and you've heard directly from him that there's much hope in our young people as we look to them for solutions for tomorrow. I'm Kili'i Akina, your host on Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Until next week, aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.